So, um, hello, and welcome to our study of mathematical biology one. Okay, so you know when you talk about mathematical biology, we are just trying to describe some processes in biology using mathematical models. Okay, so one of the things that we try to describe using mathematical models are epidemics or okay, infectious diseases. So today we'll be talking about the SIR model. Okay. So the SIR model was developed by Kermack and McKendrick in the year 1927. And they developed that for MMR diseases. That's measles, mumps, and rubella. So the SIR model is a compartmental model, and it's the simplest of them, and which is used to model infectious epidemic diseases. Okay, so that's basically the summary of what our SIR model is. So in the SIR model, the total population size N was split into three different subgroups or classes. So we have the susceptible class represented by S of T, the infectious class I of T, and the recovered class R of T. So in some books you might see the removed class. So it's the same thing as a recovered class, okay? All right, so we are saying that the total population size N was divided into three subgroups or three classes. That's the susceptible, the infectious, and the recovered. So what are these things? Okay. So when you talk about a susceptible, it's a person who has never contracted an infectious disease but he or she can contract it upon exposure to an infected person. Then, an infected person is anyone who has contracted an infectious disease and can transmit it to another person. And finally, recovered is anyone who has permanently recovered from his or her illness and cannot contract the infectious disease upon exposure to the infection. So. Um, these were the three subgroups Kermack and McKendrick divided the population into. So that means if you recover, you become immune, okay? Become immunized to the infection. You can't contract it again. So, you know, when you are trying to, um, you know, develop any mathematical models, we have to make assumptions, all right? And that helps the model to be very simple. So Kemak and McKendrick made some assumptions. So let's go through the assumptions and shortcomings of the SIR model by Kemak and McKendrick in 1927 without vital dynamics. So when we say without vital dynamics, what we mean is that um, he excluded birth and death rates. That means birth and death rates were not included, okay? That's what we mean by the without vital dynamics. So the first assumption was that the population size is constant. Okay, so what they meant by that was that birth rate was equal to death rate, and the number of people who move into the country was equal to, or the number of people who move into the population was equal to the number of people who move out of the population. That is, immigration rate was equal to immigration rate. So based on this, they are trying to say the population is constant, okay, over time. Then the second assumption they made was that the waiting or incubation period of the disease is ignored. So they assume that as soon as someone gets infected, the person can transmit the disease. But for instance, when you talk about measles, for instance, if you get it, you can transmit it to another person until some time. But for Kemak and McKendrick, they ignore the incubation period of the disease. Then the third assumption they made was that the people mix homogeneously. 
And what they meant by this was that anyone who gets into contact with, in, with an infected person would also be infected. But that's not true. Because if someone is infected and the person should get in contact with about, let's say, 10 people, it could be that none of them could get a disease or some of them, but not all of them. Okay, so that was an assumption they also made, which was a shortcoming. Then the fourth one was the rate at which people become infected is proportional to the number of infected persons present at that time. Okay, so these were the four assumptions by Kermack and McKendrick. You might find others or similar ones in textbooks. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's talk about the compartmental diagram for the SIR model. So, you know, we have our total population, N. And this was split into what? Three subgroups. Those who were susceptible, infected, and those who had recovered. Okay. So this diagram here happens to be the compartmental model for the SIR model, okay? So we are coming to derive some differential equations from this. So, you know, this one is for people who don't have the disease. And those people get in contact with infected people and they can become infected, okay? So we introduce a constant here called beta. And this beta stands for the transmission rate. And if someone is in the infective class, the person can recover, okay? So the person can recover to this class. So we introduce a constant here called gamma. Okay, let me, so called gamma. And we say gamma is the recovery rate. Okay, so now we want to find the rate. Okay, so we want to find the rate of change of the word susceptibles. Okay, so that means we want to find ds dt. But we know the SDT, okay, is, so before someone who is susceptible can become infected, unless the person was getting in contact with was an infected person, right? So the SDT is directly proportional to S times I. So the time there means a susceptible person gets in contact with an infected person, okay? But our constant here is the transmission rate beta. And we have our SI, right? Okay, so let's look at something here. You could see that if, let's say, we have 100 people here, and 10 of them get in contact with an infected person, and let's say five of them is infected. The five will begin by what we have here, and this one is going to lose five. So that means the numbers in those who are susceptible will decrease, but those infected will gain that number. So as a result of that, we introduce a minor sign here. Okay, and this differential equation happens to be the SDT, so the rate of change of the susceptibles. And we name this equation one. Then we go to the I, the T. And one thing, you could see that S of T, just having one arrow to I of T. So that means when you're writing our differential equation, you only get one equation. So I, for instance, you could see that I gains from S of T loses to R of T. So when you're writing the equation for I, you're going to get two equations, okay? So writing our second equation, the I dt, that's the rate of change of the infectives. 
So note that the infectives they gain from those in this class and they lose to those in this class. So as a result of that, um, the first equation is beta SI, okay? And it is positive because they are gaining the infectives gain from the susceptible class and the infectives they lose to the what recovered class and our constant here is gamma the transmission rate so we have here to be gamma i and this happens to be equation two in equation three the rdt the rate of change of the recoveries is just you know we have one arrow here so those who recovered always move from the infective class. So we assume there is nothing like immunization, okay? So that means you are going to get the RDC will be equal to gamma times I. So gamma times I. And it is equation three. So whenever we have differential equations, we try to set out conditions to them, initial value conditions to them so that we can solve them. So let's set our initial conditions to these three differential equations we are having. So we have to get S at zero, I of zero, and R of zero. So S of zero means at the start of the epidemic, how many people were susceptible, okay? so. The same as our S naught. And you know, at the start of the epidemic, aside those who are infected, everyone will be what? Susceptible. So that means that at the start of the epidemic, the susceptible class is always what? Greater than what? Zero. So S naught is always greater than zero. Then the epidemic is always started. Sorry, the epidemic always gets started because someone is in what infected. So that means that our I of zero or I naught is also always greater than what zero. Then at the start of the epidemic, normally no one recovers. So our R as zero is what zero. So this happens to be the three initial conditions we impose on our differential equation. Okay. So this happens to be the equation for the SIR model without vital dynamics in its simplest form, okay? All right, so let's do one thing. We are coming to do justification of the population size of the constant of constant towards population. So you know, one thing Kemak and McKendrick assume was that they, um, total population was constant, right? So they had to what? Show that. So our total population N was divided into what? Three subgroups, S at T, I at T, R at T, right? And he was like, the population was what? Constant. That is S at T plus I T plus R T is equal to what C, the constant there. So let's try to see if that's true. So we have to add equations one, equations two, and equations three. So this equation one, equation two, equation three. So that means we have the S, the T, plus the i, the t, plus the r, the t. When you make substitution, the s, the t is this, right? Then the i, the t is this, and this is the r, the t. So you can see that this cancels this, and this cancels this. That means you will get d, the t out, we have S plus I plus what R equals zero. So we have the S plus I plus R 
we call zero dt. So when we integrate both sides, we have s at t plus i at t plus r at t. When you integrate zero, you get what? A constant, right? So you get a constant. So you can see that from here, we've been able to show that the total population size is what? Constant. Because s of t plus i of t plus r of t is equal to what? C. It's supposed to be equal to n, which is a constant. So it means this n, the population size is constant. Okay, so this is an introductory lesson to the SRR model, lesson one. So in lesson two, we will talk about analytic solution of the SIR model, okay? So we will find our SRT, maybe R of T and I of T. So see you in the next lesson. Don't forget to like the video and share to your friends to help them. Thank you.